Welcome to the Critical Media Studies Podcast. We're your hosts, Mike Rapici and Barry Falk. Hello, Mr. Michael. How are you this afternoon? I'm doing well, Mr. Barry. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, we have a interesting task today, or, or perhaps some would say foolhardy, but we don't say foolhardy. We say interesting, and we we're up to the challenge. Yes. We, <laughs> we might say ambitious. Um, yeah, I, I think ambitious is a fair word. We're going to talk a uh, fair word to describe it. We're going to talk about Jacques Derrida's 1972 lecture, uh, eventually published publication, um, um, published essay entitled Signature Event Context. And we're going to talk about, um, see, I guess the broad liniments of what we're doing is um, in this essay, Derrida presents his challenge to, I guess, reigning paradigms, traditional paradigms of communication and traditional ways of understanding how we communicate with each other through writing and through speech. And there are two parts to this, and, and but I should also mention where we're headed, where we're headed or the purpose of revisiting Derrida's theories of communication, his challenge to theories of communication, is we want to think about what Derrida said uh, in relation and see if it can be applied or somehow transfers to our, our current moment where AI is communicating with us and making meaning has become sort of a meaning actor, an actor on the stage of meaning making and communication. Actually, it's important to say this, that the AI... I mean, this seems to be the current alarm. Tell me if you think this is right, Michael. Um, I mean, we've had AI in our lives a while now. Every uh -huh. time Siri was saying, hey, is it going to rain today? And it answered us. Or every time we asked Siri to play us something <laughs> on our, our phones or our whatever, um, we were activating AI. So... It, AI was communicating with us, but the recent flurry in the wake of ChatGPT and other, other AI devices, now it seems that, uh, and this is why we're alarmed all of a sudden, it seems that we're alarmed because AI is out of context, but it is producing in, in, in a, a situation where we have a speaker, but because it's a mechanical speaker, an artificial uh, interlocutor. It's difficult to talk about context and meaning inherent that inheres in the subject because it's mechanical. <laughs> it's a mechanical sender. Um, and but nonetheless, what it's communicating is meaningful discourse. Like, and that's like, why we get that's why we're getting uh, agitated. And Derrida's revisiting this paradigm or thinking about this paradigm of sender message communication and challenging it and we're thinking about and so therefore i'll just finish this we're I'll just finish the thought that um in the light of this current crisis quote unquote of communication and meaning production we're we're sort of going back to derrida and see if we can shed light on the situation then and now yeah i i think that part of the problem is that our interactions with artificial intelligence for the past 20 years have been really sort of digital games of fetch, right? Like totally, go totally. Right. get me this, get me that, get me this, get me that. And what's happening now and is that your interactions with stuff like chat GPT and whatever other programs are doing similar things is that the response is starting to mimic consciousness like the the, the right, these right right and so if you can think for a second about how you know right, alarming right. it would be if you were to ask your speaker if you were to ask spotify to play you springsteen and instead of born in the usa coming through you were to get a response something like well barry that's a good idea, but you're actually more in the mood for John Mellencamp right now. Exactly. So I'm going to play you this instead. There's a, it, it's, it's, I, I'm going to, I don't know if this is the right word, but I'm going to say that the interactions have been elevated to a point now where consciousness is 
appears to be yeah, multiple. Right, right. And right, that right. what what's happened, and this is this is really the the centerpiece. I'm gonna try and use this as a bridge to get us back into Derrida, but you know, one of the centerpieces of this entire argument that he's or these arguments that he's making are about context. And the frightening thing, I or the what, what was the word you used, the disturbing thing, the 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 thing that we're very yeah. uncomfortable with now is that historically context has always been the result of human consciousness and right. now we have situations where the contextual interactions with mm -hmm. these machines is no longer one-sided um and that's i mean i don't know i don't we're, we're not accustomed to sharing the stage in this way that's right right well michael i think in that last statement, you very helpfully brought us to a core feature of the Derrida essay that we're going to, uh, a core argument of Derrida that we're going to return to when we talk about AI, because you are raising the question of how uh, the relation, which Derrida does, of the relation between presence and meaning, meaningful speech, meaningful communication, meaningful discourse, whether it's in writing or speech. So that question of, do you need a present, the, the, the problem of whether or not you, or the statement, I'll just say this, because Derrida is really taking issue with this statement. Um, all the essay signature event in context is questioning this idea that meaning and communication requires a stabilizing presence. Mm -hmm. Uh, such as the context or whatever, or of the speaker, in order for it to be meaningful. So this is an issue that we're going to be, we'll, we'll talk about this again when we get to the end and think about and address uh, the question of chat GPT more directly. Mm -hmm. But maybe we need to get, let's get back to Derrida before. Yeah. Well, let's talk about Derrida. So I, I think that it's, the, the title sort of gives this away in reverse order. If anything is given away here, this is this is my shot at saying. <laughs> is anything right. given away? Right. Right. So the title, <laughs> Signature Event Context, there's really a, a couple things going on here. And and what Derrida's concerned with, as I read him, and I I fully reserve the right to get this wrong, but is, is <laughs> Let's that... Let's just do that in advance before right. we go. Absolutely. <laughs> so the core, if I was going to try and summarize this article you know, succinctly, but clearly... The core question that he's chasing here is what or how how meaning is created, right? How how is right, right, how right. does communication function? Right? How does it occur? And, and so, how do we think about how do we think? And this is also important. He really wants a question: mm -hmm. how we conceptualize how philosophers have philosophized right. about that transfer or that production of meaning. And and to me, there's three divisions there's three sections of this and I, I i don't know how that we came to this but he's listed them signature event context but that sure. sort of runs through his argument backwards right like he ends with the notion of the signature the sex central part of the second part of this argument is really talking about performative language versus iterative language um right, which is right. talking about how the events work but the the context i think is probably the place where we want to start if for mm -hmm. no other reason, then that's though it's the third part of the title, it's really the first part of the essay. And so mm -hmm. um, I'll pose it to you. You know, this question about classical community, he, he, he takes issue with classical communication, essentially saying that, you know, it's wrong. <laughs> that it's that it's that, just a, just a little sub thing there, right? It, it, it's wrong. You want to take the first crack at explaining how he see, how he finds fault with this because I think that there's um, th this ties us in with some of our dear friends. You know, this is this it's this is going to tie us into McLuhan. If yes, that's this is there's there's a lot friend. going on yes. here, so there's room yeah. for both of us. Uh <laughs> right, right, right. Let, um, let's get us started. Okay, well, I'll get started, though I might talk about, you were talking about context, and I, I want you to hear, I want you to bring that in. But I think I'm going to try to um, answer your question or respond to your question by dealing with, the, by going to Plato mm -hmm. uh, and invoking the first term that he uses in the essay, the signature, mm -hmm. uh, to make this point, um, to make his point or try to make his point of contention with Plato. So 
beginning with Phaedrus, beginning with Plato and uh, our favorite Platonic, our favorite really difficult um, and complex uh, later Platonic dialogue, the Phaedrus, which along with Timaeus is, you know, a headache, has been a headache for readers for 2,000 years, right? Two, more than 2,000 years. We're going to go to the Phaedrus. And Derrida, as usual, has a bone to pick with philosophers in the Western tradition that begins with Plato, but extends also to, you know, he even references uh, an Enlightenment thinker, Condillac, who was one of the first Enlightenment philosophers who talked about language and philosophical terms. But according to Derrida, Condillac is still working the Plato group. Mm -hmm. And Plato gets something fundamentally wrong, um, ac according to Derrida, following, you know, Heidegger's footsteps and trying to trying to think beyond metaphysics. Derrida has a, a bone to pick with um, Platonic metaphysics, and which he argues is still there, still very present to do a pun, still very present in the Phaedrus. So here's here's where Plato's metaphysics uh, presence gets invested in or gets instantiated in Plato, in particular in the Phaedrus. And Derrida says, is using Plato as a marker saying like, you know, philosophy has gotten all this wrong. Um, so, so what did it get right and what did it get wrong? Well, what, I guess what, it, what Plato is getting right is the fact that he's right, he's responding to new media <laughs> and that he's thinking about the communication. He's thinking about the process of communication in Phaedrus. He's thinking about the, the, the problem of communication at a time of a shift between an oral paradigm and a new print. You know, I, we can't call it a print culture, but we can say a new, a new paradigm of writing. Mm -hmm. So there's a media shift going on here. Um, and faced with this crisis of communication, and of course this crisis of communication is, it, it's structural for Plato, right? Because what's the classic, what's the classic, uh, um, distinction here. Socrates was the person. Plato sets himself up as the hand servant, the, you know, the servant mm -hmm. of Socrates, the memorializer and concretizer or system maker, you know, not even as a system maker, just like he's ancillary to the Socratic text. The Socratic text is oral, but Plato is writing down his dialogue. So we have this structural tension. So in the middle of this crisis, Plato um, tries to concretize things that can't really, tries to pin down things, according to Derrida, tries to pin down things that can't be pinned down. So um, in Plato's formulation in the Phaedrus of, communi of the communication situation, there's a speaker and there is a listener. And the speech, living speech, the direct address of the speaker to the listener that had that's fully invested with presence in dairy mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. right that's the thing that's the mode of communication that has authority present by presence we basically mean full legitimacy it's the foundation for the whole situation so the foundation for communication in plato mm -hmm. even though He's writing and is very aware. And Plato marks, you know, talks about writing, as we know, as a pharmacon. Um, so he's aware that the, the paradigm is shifting, even as he's describing it. But nonetheless, in his theorization, in his philosophical, philosophical understanding or, you know, discourse on what happens in his philosophical communication theory, speech has unquestioned legitimacy. The written sign constitutes a break, however. But Plato doesn't want to linger on that break. Writing can do what speech can't. Uh, I, I probably need to articulate this one last part of it. Writing can do, writing can act as a substitute. So in other words, once you write it down, where you're now in a situation where the situation can change. The media, the new media of writing allows for absence for communication to happen in the absence of a speaker. 
So, but Plato doesn't want to, will not acknowledge that the game has changed. Instead, he still says, yes, I know that writing does this, but it's dangerous that it does this. It's something problematic about writing that it does this, that it makes absence palpable, that it communicates in the absence of the speaker. True. And, and so therefore, this is what Derrida is trying to critique, this notion that communication is somehow truer, pure, because it's coming out of the vocal oral address of the speaker. And you know that is an example of the metaphysics of presence that Derrida wants to question. So I want to let me stop right there and, and see if there's something. How, how have I flubbed it? And I have one more thing I want to I want to mention the signature. And then I'll then I'll, I'm done. But I think this, I well, I feel I'm flubbing it. Here, no, I don't. So I don't think you, you 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 let me before we get into the signature because I I suspect that the question I'm going to answer you, or the question I'm going to ask you, pardon, yeah. is going to require the signature as a part of the answer. But I think yeah. just to clarify things a little bit, yeah, please from the from 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 the Platonic perspective, what what is the I mean? So we understand that the the thing that writing does is that it extends the reach of communication, right? Right. Right. But it does so at the cost of presence. The one thing that you need with speech is a speaker. You have to be physically present. So the writing frees conveyance of a message. That it frees commun. And I'm not saying they're the same thing here necessarily, but it frees us to communicate across time and distance in a way right. that speech does not allow. And life and death. And life well, and death. Yes. Right? Yes. Right? right. So I mean, we yes, we we're still reading Shakespeare. Right. right? But the danger, how how do we how is this dangerous exactly? Is it dangerous because it is not authentic? And is the signature supposed to somehow appease that or satisfy that problem? Well, okay, no, that, that's a great question. And I and I'm gonna I'm gonna posit an answer, but you tell me what you think. I, I think that that what you just said is is um is speech somehow more authentic? That was your question, right? That's a big and part. I of think it. I I think Derrida, uh, Derrida feel cries foul on Plato for saying precisely that. That in although there's a kind of bad faith that he's accusing Plato of, Plato is aware that writing changes the game of communication utterly for doing by doing all the things you mentioned. But then in his metaphysics of writing. His theory of writing, Plato's theory of writing, he is assuming and positing that, well, I'll tell you what's the what's gold in this system. The gold happens when Michael Rapici talks directly to Barry Falk, and I can hear Michael Rapici's words. That's the authentic Rapici. And that becomes the model for all good communication. That's where Derrida Christ found. Does right. that make sense? Is that it, that's it does. Different? Now let me let me try uh -huh. and clarify this. And really, all I'm going to do is complicate it. Um, oh, but good. Thank the, you. I'm all. So I'm going to gonna ask. I'll ask another question. Sure. Um, is the superiority of hmm. speech over hmm. written the not only is the superior the heightened authenticity of hmm. speech over writing right given the absence implicit in writing mm -hmm. i think that the assumption this is a question presented as, as a declarative st sentence i'm sorry um <laughs> is that because we assume that somehow the presence of a speaker enables a higher degree of accuracy and a lower likelihood of misunderstanding in other words, when you have speech, what you also have theoretically implicit in speech or endemic to speech is the ability to go backwards, to try again, right? To you, you, you invoke all sorts of nonverbal communications. Well, that's true. To right. enable this. Right. Whereas, so like, you know, if I'm standing in front of a classroom and I'm talking to my students, and I see them glazing over or taking a very keen interest in their cuticles or whatever the case may be. 
I have multiple channels here. I can say, wow, perhaps I need to try this again to be more accurate, to make sure that this intended message is getting through. Whereas with the written word, right? All you have is that moment and that moment appears on the surface to almost lose context. I mean, this is this this notion of content, and I'm I'm not suggesting that's the case. I think that certainly you you cannot have an acontextual moment. But the idea that I see Derrida really wrestling with here hmm. is the idea that for every signifier, there is a concrete signified, that for every word, there hmm. is a very specific translation or instance of that word and that the right. spoken communication enables us to secure that more effectively you know michael that's a great question that i can only um i'm only just going to babble a little bit to try and do an answer mm -hmm. because i i think that's the question i'm going to gesture toward an answer and then of course our listeners are going to be able to you know, I'd love to hear what listeners think about this, because I think you asked the core question, uh, which is like, so what's wrong? <laughs> what's basically what's his issue with Plato? What's Derrida's issue with Plato? What is he getting wrong when he talks about more authentic speech? And I think it comes down to this. I'm going to try to stab. Mm -hmm. um, I think it really comes down to this, that. I think this signifies Derrida's commitment to philosophical materialism as against against a philosophical idealism. That so there is a, basically a fundamental argument about metaphysics, about whether metaphysics is a valid philosophy that I think is at the heart of this disagreement. Here's what I mean. If you are like Plato, as we know, I mean, everybody knows that Plato is an idealist in terms mm -hmm. of, right, Every, the material world. This is the modern materialist ever since, ever since, I guess, I don't know, 17th century and the scientific revolution and all the philosophers that came in the wake, but especially in the 19th century. And then extending to Derrida, the, the anti-Platonist um, turn has always said Plato feels that ideas are primary and matter is secondary. It's the reverse. What the hell is going on here? I do feel that at issue, what Derrida, what's at issue here in Derrida's critique of Plato is the sense that Plato feels that oral communication is not material and that it belongs to this living, it partakes of the ideal nature of reality and therefore is more authentically true because authentic truth is in the realm of the ideals. It's not in the material realm. And by emphasizing and sort of to bring Derrida back into this, what Derrida is going to be saying throughout the essay, right? What he wants to talk about is writing and what's writing. It's holding up my page of notes here uh, as I do this. Writing is material. Writing involves uh, the element of matter, right? So in speaking for writing, I mean, there is a paradox right there. Derrida in this essay is speaking, <laughs> is putting his authority for writing. But if you're invested in, as opposed to Plato's tremulous about writing, he's worried, he's anxious about writing. Writing is a pharmacon. It actually hurts memory. Which that was means his problem. Right. That was his problem. And hurting memory, let's get back to the Plato's metaphysics, right? Why is it bad to hurt memory? Memory is how you get in touch with the Platonic ideals. That's how you get in touch with the divine forms. You're accessing mm -hmm. your memory. So writing is a material practice. The new media of writing, it's never going to be good in Plato's eyes. And Plato and Derrida realizes that. And like I said, in this essay throughout, uh, and, and basically, he's going to mutate his uh, uh, his quarrel with Austin will just be another form, uh, another modality of his argument with uh, about Plato is that he wants to take writing and the materiality, the the ephemerality. Uh, matter is also ephemeral, <laughs> right? Matter is also ephemeral. But he Der Derrida. So another just to wrap this up. Derrida is trying to speak for 
uh, against presence, the presence of ideas, and speaking for the medium, the new medium of writing in all its materiality. I think I think you've hit on it. I mean, the idea of the forms for Plato is this stable, perfect, unchanging thank, thank thing. Thank you. Yes, unchanging. And, that was the word, right? And, and writing Der is not. Derrida's argument about language is that it never that, that meanings are multiple, right? That that, that any right. any term you you choose to use. The, and I think this is for him a strength, not a, not a flaw, that any any term yes, has exactly. right, multiple. Right. He's and this speaking is, for it. He's speaking for that. Yes, it's not a flaw. I'm no, speaking for right. It. That 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 unlike so for Plato, the forms are what they are for eternity. That for is eternity. all. Right. And exactly. if language is an attempt to get to that, we have to be looking at a static conception, whereas Derrida is looking at context as being the all defining thing in a given moment for which never stays the same for language which is always slippery right like we don't right. i guess right. so the difference is if we look at language through a platonic lens the signified is always a very specific thing mm -hmm. whereas if we look at language through a deridian lens it's just a long the signif the what should be the signified is always just going to be a bunch of other signifiers which are uh, are representative of the context at a particular point in time. I think that's the big switch here is that hey hey, we may have done something here, Barry. this is good that that Plato's looking to a stable ideal that Derrida just doesn't see as being a thing. And this to me, you know, we had mentioned earlier we had sort of teased a McLuhan tie-in here. so I'm gonna is, is if if McLuhan's argument about the medium being the message, right, that the meaning is not tied so much to any particular language, it's tied to the form of 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 uh, what's how am I saying this? The it's tied to mm, Barry. Help me! I'm I'm <laughs> I'm on the verge of saying something that I want to say and I can't. Um, the medium. Yeah is context uh -huh. for McLuhan. And I think that Derrida is really opposed to this. So for example, if we say through McLuhan's lens, what you watch on television is infinitely less important than the fact that you are watching television, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so McLuhan is taking meaning and not, it's like he's looking elsewhere, but he's still looking at a stable thing. The medium defines this. So, McLuhan's not concerned with context at all. He's concerned hmm. with form. He's concerned with the medium form. Yeah, the form of the media. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Where, yes, not not Plato's form, but the- Not the Plato's form, form, the form of the media. Right, right, right. right. Um, the medium. Right. So I, I feel like there's still in McLuhan ambiguity in terms of the fact that there are different mediums through which things can be experienced but they are still clearly defined and delineated. One is not the other. Whereas I think that Derrida is going to kick at that and say that the contact, and this is one of my real questions when we get to the AI point, is really how, you know, we talk about algorithms um, as sort of this process of reaching a decision on something. Mm. Um I'm really kind of curious as to how far down we can individualize context. I mean, I like, you know, whether or not there's, there's, there's a Mike context and a, I mean, and a Barry context, for example, like, are we mm -hmm. experiencing the same thing differently because of our own personal out? Well, I'll, we'll get to that later. Um, anyways, that, that was my, I think my tie into to McLuhan for this. McLuhan, the it, no, it's a very, it's a very good one. And maybe we're, we will have a chance to talk more about your media point and the McLuhan point, uh, because I think it's, it's, it's interesting the way Derrida, I think, well, I know this, that um, uh, the extent of my knowledge that Derrida was a critical reader of McLuhan. Uh, so he, he knew him, but mm. he was critical. He, he knew of his work, but he was critical of him for uh, insisting on 
a solid break. Now, I don't know. I think it's arguable whether McLuhan really does this, but Derrida's charge was that McLuhan assumed too solid a break between the oral tradition and the written tradition. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, that to, so to, so to, um, so to um, Derrida, uh, McLuhan was not very supple in, in thinking about media and me changes between media. Um, but maybe that's something, maybe we should uh, try and explicate Derrida before, and we can return to what yeah, interfaces yeah, yeah. with McLuhan before at the I don't, end. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to get lost in, in, in the McLuhan. Yeah. Well, well, here. well, we'll put, what, did, what did we say? We say, we'll put a pin in that. We'll put a pin in that, uh, and, but try to and, and get back to that at the end. Uh, but let me say something in relation to what you were talking about. Uh, I loved all the stuff you were saying about context um, and, 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 or rather, what you were saying about like the ground of Derrida's quarrel with Plato. And maybe I can bring in the signature and the concept of iterability here to illustrate as a final illustration uh, before we, and it also might be a way to segue into Austin, but as a final iteration of Derrida's quarrel with uh, the notion of more authentic, speech being more authentic, um, than writing and Derrida's commitment to, um, you know, to, to writing in the face of writing's malleability, uh, temporality, um, ephemerality, all the things you were referring to. So the signature is really for Derrida, as I understand it. Tell me what you think. Um, the signature is par excellence, the example of why Plato got it wrong. And we'll, I'll keep on talking about it we'll, in, in the way we've been talking about it in terms of like how new media reformats old ways of going about things. Once you have the signature, I think Derrida's major point is that once you have something like the signature in writing, it's not a small thing. It is an epical change because Whereas Plato's thinking, well, communication depends on a speaker and the speaker has to be present for that true communication and a con you know, a flow of ideas to occur. The signature is the material medium that absolutely confutes that, that principle. Signature, the, the writer doesn't have to be present. It signifies in a multiplicity, the signification becomes the important thing not the direct dialogue. The signature is a signifier that can function even when the person is dead. The person does not have to be present. The person doesn't have to be present on earth for the signature to be binding. So it's the ultimate example of Derrida's key term, iterability. Writing introduces iterability into meaning. And once meaning has been reformatted by writing, so that it's infinitely exchangeable, fungible, iterable. All bets are off. Plato is wrong, and everybody's going to be wrong until J.L. Austin, who partly gets it right. So when we talk about iterability, we're talking about, just to clarify again, we're talking about the ability for something to be understood and then to the function also be, to have present to have authority without presence right right and so uh you know he talks about the citation right that too right and this of is this, this is right. i think an aspect of the iterability right it, like indeed, but, indeed, but what's significant indeed. about that and i think what what really sinks plato along these lines is that when you take a communication, whether it's a signature, whether it's a chunk of text, whatever it is, when you take that and you cite it, what you've done is you have removed something from its original context and hmm. you have mm -hmm. created a new context for it. In other words, Absolutely. you have divested it of its original location and place and meaning to a large degree. And you have reappropriated it or refocused or reshaped that meaning for your own ends 
And so this is obviously worlds away from what Plato's wanting to see happen. Right, I mean, right. you know, how dare you? But you can now make meaning do so you can make something that on the surface means one thing serve Absolutely. another purpose and so that I, I think the term he is it something um was it mark right that that that, that sure is, is a sign that we've we've changed the original context into something different right uh beautifully said and how how about i sum up what we said so far really i talked about iterability in the signature and then it's a one-two punch that he delivers against that Derrida does against Plato the signature is the ultimate example of iterability but also the quotation mark mm -hmm. and the possibility of citation it's game over I mean this is where I think it articulates broadly speaking with McLuhan this idea that meaning is the medium these are devices or techniques in the medium that the medium of writing enables, signature, the quotation, the citation. These are things that like it spells, I'll say it one more time, but the last time I went. Game over for the metaphysics of presence. Once you have a new medium that has these different techniques, you can't talk about meaning as come as something that's communi directly, communicated directly from a speaker to a listener right to an because it, because we yeah. can we can screw with it so let's we'll use this then as a uh jumping off point to talk about austin well let me try and oh. do this in two sentences if i could just well, because i'm can. thinking about time this is I, name that, name, name, this is the philosophical name that tune barry you get two name sentences that tune. i'm gonna try and do it in two sentences uh so you don't try because i'm excited to get to the ai bit and so i don't want it dairy dot to swallow us whole here so I think we we we've probably said more than enough about Plato. I'm going to try. Now I'm not going to I'm going to fail. So you're going to help me, but I'm going to try. I had some notes about Austin, uh -huh. and I'm going to talk about Derrida's um, quarrel with Austin that kind of ends the essay. But I'm going to try to a subsume it in, in the larger his larger argument against Plato, and see if you like this, um, and then see if I can do this kind of succinctly. So. Um, I like, you know, Derrida says, I like Austin. Uh -huh. What do I like about him? He doesn't, he discard by talking about ordinary language or everyday language. Uh, it's th th the focus is off, unlike Plato or a Kondiak, the focus is off that primal scene where I'm talking with Mike Rupici and trying to convey me. Now, language itself spoken language, oral language, and we'll get into that in a moment, but language is determining meaning. In certain material settings, I pronounce you man and wife, whatever, right? Those words have meaning because of their context. So Derrida likes this because now we're thinking, now Austin seems to be thinking in language, about language and its uses in a more fungible way in a more materialist way because the words themselves are doing things the words themselves are doing things and it's not a matter of my primal intention the primal primary intention or aims of the speaker uh that are being conveyed to the the person being addressed by the speaker so that's good what doesn't he like about it is that basically he feels Der by he i mean derrida what what doesn't what doesn't appeal to Derrida in Austin's new framing? Um, and I should mention the key word. Austin has a theory of this is what he's famous for, J.L. Austin, uh, the ordinary language philosopher. How to do things with words is his major text. Um, he's responsible for the idea, which is still widely influential and and important in linguistic theory, this idea of performative utterances, that there are words that do things in certain contexts. And it's mm -hmm. not about what I mean to do. It's not my about my intention when I say it. I'm, you know, it aims and intentions and interiority, they have a role in this, but the words themselves are enabled by a context and a kind of material situation. Right. It's a performance. Okay. And it acknowledges the real world in a mm -hmm. way that Derrida felt 
Plato didn't. Okay, so in a, uh, try, now I'll try and get a little bit more compact. Um, I think Derrida is critical of a residue of Plato. That he, he detects a residue of Plato in Austin. In that context, he feels, becomes the unspoken ground that provides meaning in a transcendental way. And basically, um, Derrida says there is no ground in utterance. Even context is something, context, because it's changeable, cannot serve as the ground for communication. Derrida is consistent in his critique of Plato and Austin, in other words, of this idea that our communication does not have uh, does not require a theory of presence to allow communication to occur, to allow meaning to occur. Does that make sense? No, it didn't. It, I well, felt say, I say that last bit one last time. Well, he feels, uh, I'm going to see if I can say it better because I think I need to return to it and say it a little bit better, but maybe I'm I'm struggling a little bit on this and, and that's what you're hearing in my, my so, discourse. So I, I think but, that... This idea that, you know, uh, well, I'll refer back to the essay and, and let me try take one pass on this, referring to what, thinking back on Derrida's final move, his critical readings of Austin, where he seems to have a quarrel with Austin, are passages where people come back and say, well, wait a minute, if the meaning is in the context, isn't the context... Um, isn't that, doesn't that mean that context is fungible, the context changes and there is no anchor for meaning? But then what's Austin's reply to this? And this, and what is, and Derrida, Derrida finds Austin's reply to that charge, to that argument. He finds it, he has a quarrel with it. So Austin had a tendency, uh, according to the passages that Derrida quotes, Austin had a tendency, he often made recourse to this idea. Well, we all know what everybody was intending to do when they got together. And, you know, when you, when that person asked you to pass the salt, we all know that there was a material context that enabled, there was a very specific context that gave that speech act a ground and meaning. Um, but Derrida says, no, 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 no. You can't have it both ways. You can't say that meaning is dependent on context and then say context is something I can totally fix. And context is the new permanence. No, no, no. Meaning is free floating all the way around. Context right. doesn't stabilize meaning any more than speech does. Well, I think is that, yeah, I mean, I, is, that is that clear? I, mm, no? I, I, I think I mean, this is I, I don't think that this stuff is in and of itself doesn't lend itself to to clarity so i'm not going to say well, hey I, I sense you have a different take on what's going on with that so well so you know me. i i think the thing that we haven't talked about regarding austin and okay. the connection where, where i see austin I, I i where i see derrida's quarrel with austin is really tied to this notion of iterability and mm -hmm. citation mm -hmm. right and Austin basically says, look, performative, you know, language does something. It it, it symbols something that that, that that we recognize and uh it, it creates its own, like uh, you know, I, I now pronounce you man and wife, for example, right? That that is language that does something. And he says that the problem with performative utterances is that we can't cite them the way that Derrida wants us to be able to cite language to right. to, to clearly show the, the, the significance of context, right? Austin wants to say, look, when you try and cite performative language, and I think he uses a poet or an actor. As, yes, as, right, right, that, right, right, right. That it, that it rings hollow, that it's not yeah. like you, you've you tried to do this. I see this, this is where he, like, if you were to put Austin and Derrida next to each other, this would be Austin's quarrel with Derrida. Like you can't, that's not authentic. And Der Derrida's response, and I think this is maybe, again, part of what I'm picking up on with the AI stuff, is that, well, not really, because I don't need significant, like I, I, I have my sort of own algorithmic 
understanding of what, you know, context, essentially what this means. And I derive my meaning from that. So it doesn't matter whether right. you, the speaker of this are legitimate or authentic, right? It's just the fact that you have invoked a moment. So this language, I think the difference here is like Austin might be saying these words are doing something. And Derrida's response is no, these words invoke a context which we have an understanding of, which is part and parcel of a larger thing. And that's where the meaning comes from. For those listeners taking score, uh, uh, keeping score, Dr. Apici, 10. No. Dr. Falk, zero. Because no. that's what I was trying to say, is that, uh, that that's, that's a, I'm a, I won't repeat it and Barry explain it because that's what I was trying to say. I would, uh, would you just express that that's a wonderful, I think a wonderful way of formulating his quarrel. Um, Austin assumes uh, of, of Derrida's quarrel with Austin. Austin assumes that, oh, you know, there's uh, that uh, it perform, he wants to put a limits. He's talking about performativity and the performativity of language, but then he wants to limit it. And he says, and Derrida cries foul and says, you know, those, you say these, you know, if you utter these words in a different context, they will ring hollow. Derrida says, you have no grounds for believing that. It's what you said. I let don't want to ask you a question. I don't want to repeat this. it. Let me, but yeah. let me ask you a question about this because I want to make sure that I understand what I allegedly said here. For what I said. <laughs> okay. So All right. it's sort okay. of like this. It, it's, so would it be fair to say, for example, in terms of performative language, right? That when I sign my name on a check, right? I, that is that is performative. That's I'm here, even though I'm not here. Go ahead and cash this check. Right. And Derrida's like, yeah, good. But a forged check is still a thing, right? Like, Absolutely. So Absolutely. somebody else can perform that. And that signature there is still going to enable this to happen. That's iterability. Good. Including the risk and danger of the forged inauthentic performance. That's iterability. That's what writing does. That's the way, that's part of the, you know, hitting the, the reset that writing does, according to Derrida. And, you know, basically he feels that Austin is making a platonic estate, mistake. Mm -hmm. That when Austin says, well, you can't, we all know the difference. We're all men here. We're all Oxford educated men here. We all know the difference when uh, we all know what's up, uh, you know, and basically Austin is saying that like we all persons of good faith. We all know what things mean. And Derrida says, no, well, the, 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 right, right, the, because the problem here, again, is this notion of authenticity right. is tied to a single conception Absolutely. of right and wrong. Absolutely. Again, it's Plato again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 OK, so, yes. Five minutes ago, you did it. Ugh. This is all, this is all, uh, this is all, I don't know what's the word, uh, epilogue to your, your, uh, we are now, uh, I, I do feel like I need to open a bottle of champagne. We are through the dairy diet saying, I'm going to hand it over to you. I don't want it. Um, to talk about AI. Yeah, no, let's do it. So let's, the, the, well, actually, I don't want so much to talk about AI. I, I think so much as I want to sort of talk about, again this notion of this this weird sort of hodgepodge of authenticity and context and algorithms sen as sense making and it's where we started in the beginning right like why are we so unsettled by okay. by okay. these things and so the question that that you know i have and i think this comes on the on on the heels of this discussion about performative language and Derrida's response about this essentially being um, understood in context, right? Is is that you know how much is context algorithmic? How much is human speech even algorithmic? I mean, we don't. I don't know about you, but there's there's. I imagine you're probably similar to me, and I'm probably similar to most people in the sense that there are just certain situations where you run through a predetermined script, your conversations are not 
authentic in the sense that you are trying to right, create right, a particular right, meaning. Right, right. These are just our canned responses to things. And that makes up, I think, a surprisingly large percentage of the communicating that we do, even in situations that require a fairly high degree of thought and, you know, one would hope a high degree of um, accuracy. We're st I mean, I can't, ha hell, ha half of this podcast is me trying to figure out what I'm going to say after I've said it, you know? And so I'm wondering hmm. Hmm. how that fits with this discussion about meaning and, and the question of how communication happens. You know, we had mentioned in, in, in a pre-production meeting about somebody reading this and saying, well, this is about communication being impossible. And I don't think it's about communication being impossible. I think it's about communication really being a very fluid thing. And that, and what's your, okay, you know, oh, I don't want to interrupt. Go ahead. Well, just the thing. idea that, there, there, that, that, yeah. that if you're yeah. looking at yeah. this, if you look at communication as, 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 if you're looking at a model of communication through the idea of signify or signified, where that signified is a relatively static conception and that, there is such a thing as an agreed upon meaning for anything. Um, you know, Der Derrida's gonna say, well, this is a real problem. This doesn't work like that. And what I'm wondering is if, if the problem or the fallout is misunderstanding or is what hmm. we would probably refer to as a failed communicative attempt, hmm. right? What do we make of the fact that so much of our communication happens by rote. Hmm. Uh, I think we're okay. I, I have a response to that. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I want to say is I want to respond in a sentence directly to what you just said. How do, can you rephrase just your last sentence? Cause I have a one sentence comment on it that I think is going to set up what I want to say in in a in a larger answer to your question. Well, so I'll, I'll, I'll phrase that. it. How, I'll, what 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 problem? Yeah, the, if you can do it, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try it. I, I think I, sure. I'll use different words. Um, okay, but you know, I think that Derrida is arguing that we make sense of language sure. via context. Right. And my question and is, to most what of our do... contexts are most of our contexts, or rather, most of our communication. Is dependent on context, but it's, it's also driven wrote. by context. It is driven by context, but also okay. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, respond. It's a great question and great problem, and so um, what what does Derrida and what do we? Well, let me start with by saying I'm going to answer your question in this regard. Your question is. What do we, you know, how do we feel? How do we respond to the fact that when we reflect upon it, most of our communication is inauthentic in the sense that it's being driven, it's being scripted. It's being driven and produced by a pre-existing context or pre-existing social script or something like that. What do we do with the fact that so much of our earnest, authentic communication is not really that earnest or authentic? And so here's my quick answer to that. And then I have a longer answer. Quicker answer is this. We're embarrassed by it. We're embarrassed by it. Now I'm going to, and that we're a little bit ashamed of the fact that we realize that implicitly, I, I, I'm saying that there's a kind of existential lack that we realize. And I, um, I'm going to take this to Derrida and then also to AI. So I think we're very aware and very highly conscious of our of the inauthentic by those terms that you were describing, nature of our discourse. I want to, now let me get this to Derrida. And what I see is that, so this is kind of my closing comment. I'm, I'm in, in, in further and elaborating on this answer that we're embarrassed by it. I'm gonna invoke Derrida and then I'm going to talk about AI real quickly. So let me invoke Derrida. And what I take to be the function of the essay, and I'm interested in what you think on this. I think Derrida throughout the essay, and I like the way we ended up, it turned out, I think, hopefully for our listeners, but um, I, I certainly found it helpful to talk about Derrida's essay in terms of the common thread linking his criticism of Plato with Austin. 
I kind of like that we that that's how the path we took through the essay, because I see Derrida's function or purpose in this essay as being a kind of referee, philosophical referee. This is what he's trying to do, that he's he cries foul. He's a scorekeeper or goalkeeper. He cries foul when he feels the players are going out of bounds. And so he when Plato says there's something going on now with writing, writing is changing the nature of communication. Turns out, OK, fine, fine. Goalkeeper, scorekeeper, uh, uh, referee Derrida says, fine, that's true. And then Plato makes a move and says, hey, you know what? I miss the old way in which orality communicated. The oral way was the best way. I know we have a newfangled way, but I'm suspicious of it. Derrida cries foul. No, no, you can't go back. Okay. And then Austin, I feel he's also crying foul. Allow me, allow me to finish this because I'm going to try to wrap this up with AI too uh, and get back to your point about our embarrassment. So Austin, uh, Austin brings up the performative, uh, gives the, the wonderful example of the performative utterance. Derrida says, great, you're in bounds. Um, then um, Austin tries to tie down meaning to the specific context. And then Derrida cries foul. So now, uh, so that's the substance of signature uh, of the arguments, I think, in signature event context. Now, to Derrida and AI, I think what Derrida is doing in this essay and what I take from the essay and I'm applying to our unease with ChatGPT and anxiety about AI is this. I think we are in a situation where we realize, I'm thinking specifically, Michael, did you read this story? It was recent. Um, it was a recent New York Times story. I don't know if, how, how broadly how broadly circulated, but, but besides being in the Times, obviously. But um, I think it was a Times correspondent that, you know, uh, was using ChatGPT to respond to a girlfriend. Like it was going to write your text for a girlfriend. Now, this I is I didn't, but now I'm, I'm, I'm sad that I didn't. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, isn't that a perfect example of exactly what you're saying? And I'm going to try to bring in Derrida out of this and I'll, I'll shut the F up after I do this. But um, that strikes me as a flashpoint why we're a flashpoint event. This is a perfect example why we feel anxious with the new AI technology. Because the fact that we can have ChatGPT respond to our partner and simulate our responses to our partner, our text to our partner, the fact that we can do that, I mean, are we upset about AI? No. We're upset about the fact that the machine is showing us that what we do in our authentic platonic dialogue with our partner isn't that authentic at all. And that to me is a Derridian lesson that after writing, there is no going back. There's only going forward without presence. We don't have apologies now. And AI is yet another instance of a medium showing us the limitations of, um, I want to say the limitations of the human. I'm going to go out and jump out of bounds and say, this is one of the ways, I mean, I suppose the question of the post-human was initially posed when we made the transition from when humankind makes the transition uh, from orality to writing. But ChatGPT is obviously posing the question now, well, how human are you in relation to yeah, like, what does it mean about you, not about AI? What does it mean about you that a machine can produce the same meanings you do, that it can offer as a simulacra for Michael Rapici? So let me let okay. me ask let me ask you a question because this is really uh, it's a provocative take on this. Um, so I if I'm understanding you correctly, and I hope I am, because I really it's grim, but I I really find this fascinating. That the problem with that we're seeing 
manifest in AI, but there's a direct connection to what Derrida is arguing here in terms of presence, right? Absolutely. Dialogue yeah. to connection. And when you Correct. can have something Correct. that is completely devoid of presence, right? Because it's nothing more than ones and zeros. I mean, there is no, there, there's nothing here. There's nothing human here. When you can have something that is completely devoid of presence, effectively, or at the very least, plausibly, take your part. communication. Right, right, the right. Question then, the question then really becomes one of connection. Right. And if we look at Derrida and say, okay, I'm going to buy into this, then what we're really forced to realize here is that a lot of the interactions that we may have that we think of as being exactly. connected are really performed because he doesn't have right. a problem with performative uh, you know, no, language. No, no, there, no. There, it's when he tries to ground, when Austin tries to ground the performative, that's what he says. And I think that's the it. problem is maybe what we're looking at here is language as performance, but not connecting, right? Totally right. That, that, totally that, right. The, that the, totally the real right. struggle I here, think. and I think this is fascinating because if we think about, um, you know, some of the problems that we have with, with communication, the problem is always around this failure to connect. Right. The failure totally to right. somehow yeah. encode and decode yeah. language effectively um, that this is really. I mean, this is this is this, this is a human crisis of an epic scale, because what we're seeing here is that machines are basically able to create a passable version of connection right. or at, at the very least, if they fail, highlight our own inability to do so as well. Absolutely. And that last part to me is really what I keyed in your comment that it is our perception, our growing perception of our inability to communicate. That I think is the nub of this thing. And that's the nub of our anxiety. I said I would sign off, but I, um, and this, what I'm about to raise is actually another, maybe another podcast episode or will fit in another episode, but I have to raise it since you, you, I think brilliantly bring up I think you hit the key term that set me off here. Key term is our awareness of our inability or incapacity of the ways in which we miss the mark in our quote unquote normal human thing. I want to talk about the another case of anxiety induced by AI that I think as one least, might not be enough. Let's because <laughs> let's cause we need another. <laughs> let's do one more. But I will purposely, I promise you, I'll purposely, for the sake of humanity, I will curtail this. But just, I'll keep it, I'll keep it in a minimum, but I, I have to bring it up since I think of this other instance exactly in the terms that you've been describing. So allow me to use this opportunity to talk about. It. I feel that the anxiety generated by AI in relation to music the real reason for that anxiety, and I know record companies and performers worry about copyright. They worry about profits. I get that. I get it. I understand it. Whatever. Let me tell you the reason. This is my psychoanalysis of the, of the machine, of the ghost of the machine. Here's my psychoanalysis of what's going on here and what's driving the anxiety. Why are we really anxious when I saw this recently? And by the way, I don't think this was very effective, but I saw uh, there recently have been a whole spate of beetle related AI uh, doing so. like one. I've seen this. Very, I've seen this. Have you seen some of these? Uh, so I'm not even talking about McCartney using making the announcement to use AI to complete the last Beatles track, because I think that actually another subject for another day would that actually isn't what I'm talking about. I'm. Um, I think that, that actually Maca is drumming up some false possibility, some, you know, kind of made up publicity for this because I don't think it's, it's not really germane to our topic. So let me get to the thing that I think is germane to the topic. Um, I saw, a, or I, and I listened to a cover of The Scientist by, was it Coldplay? I Coldplay. Think Which Scientist. cover did you hear? Uh, the cover I heard was a John Lennon AI derivative. Okay, okay. Uh, so it was like John Lennon singing the lead vocal 
uh, for uh, Coldplay as a scientist. Okay. All right. So let me get to the anxiety. I don't want to spin off into music because, you know, spin off into music discourse because we'll be here for another 10 hours and I don't want to do that. Um, and I wouldn't ask that for the listeners. But I mentioned that example just to show to showcase what I'm what I'm trying to convey with this idea of AI causing anxiety. I think AI anxiety is largely um, it's the effect of us looking. AI is forcing ourselves, forcing us to look in the mirror and we don't like what we see. In the case of the chat GPT, just to briefly rehearse what we were just been saying, in the case of the uh, in the case of the chat GPT technology, that allows you to communicate with your partner without having to be involved, we're embarrassed by the fact that 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 simulacra works so bloody well. Mm -hmm. In music, I feel it's a similar psychological nerve or that's being touched off. I feel that the current spate of creativity, where we mix and match John Lennon with Coldplay, where we say, wouldn't it be kind of cool if the Beatles sang a song by Kanye and we mix and match? I think that why, why we're upset about that is really because it shows us that we're in a no-go zone with culture. We've dead-ended that the the best that we can think of to do something new is to find two things that don't make any effing sense to put together, but we're going to put them together. That's the height of our creativity. And Caliban looks at his reflection in the mirror and says, I'm a beast. Right. That's what AI is doing to us right now. Huh. I think, God, there's so much I want to say, but in the interest of actually having an episode that ends um i'm gonna not for now that's a, you know i don't there's something there there's something there um we're done yeah, and for those and, and, and listen, for, it, for, for, for th this is one of those things where again i think we have to we have to send this out th this yeah i'd love to hear people's thoughts on this yeah well yeah well we're Very, going to be returning to the subject of AI, and we have been returning to the subject of AI in different modes. Well, and that's so, where we you know, are. We're that's returning. Where we yeah, are. that's where we are. Um, Very thank you. Anyway, I hope it's helpful. I hope yeah. It was no, helpful this was. Our there's, listeners, there's, our listeners need to chime in to, and say where we're we're full of uh, nonsense. Okay. Well, you know, it all just depends on your point of view, man. Of view, I think that the was context. the Big Lebowski I just quoted right there, which <laughs> obviously is a natural fit to. Uh, critical studies. So Barry, thank you. This was, right, this was Michael. really enjoyable. I, I appreciate this conversation. A pleasure as always, Michael, until next time. See right, you take soon. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to the critical media studies podcast. To find out more about the show, check out our webpage at critical media studies, podcast.com.